Good evening to all of you who are here in the Canadian room. This is Alia from the Asia Email Information Network. Welcome to our special Asian Hour, which is part of our bi-monthly webinar series where we feature topics on e-health and a special schedule. We, are, we thank our speaker for this evening for waking up very early, 8 a.m. Canada time, to give us this exciting session. Our topic is on running a government-funded telemedicine network, the Ontario experience. A world leader in telemedicine, OPN helps Ontarians get more out of the healthcare system by bridging the distance of time and geography to bring more patients the care they need, where and when they need it. Using innovative technology, OPN streamlines the healthcare process while also expanding the way knowledge is shared and how the medical community interacts with each other and with their patients. An independent not-for-profit organization, OPN is funded by the Government of Ontario. And our speaker tonight, Dr. Ed Brown, will discuss the history of the OPN, the importance of governance, architecture and management in deploying telemedicine innovation involving many states, holders, province-wide. But before we start our session, there are four things we have to remember in participating to this Asian Hour webinar session. Our platform, our ways to participate, the program details, and our email feedback. We're now using Cisco WebEx Meeting Center 100. And if you are encountering problems as you participate, please log out this session and rejoin the room immediately. Our meeting room number is 863-140-838, and our short link is bitly.com slash hour. Our password is Ontario123. I am very happy to inform you that Cisco Letters Meeting Center 100 is accessible also on your mobile devices. Second, your mic will be mute for the rest of the meeting, but you can actively participate in three ways by sending your feedback, chatting your response, and posting your questions. You can send your feedback by clicking the feedback button on the right side of your screen below the participants window. It's that dialog balloon with a check mark. And on the drop down menu, you can respond by yes or no, saying the presentation is too fast or too slow. And problem, can we try the chat option? Just go to the chat box with the dialog balloon on the upper right side of your screen and then just say your feedback. Thank you very much for Maldives, um, Atika. How about the others? Are you still alive and engaged in the session? Can you just give a check mark on an X on the feedback button or a chat if you can hear my voice? Thanks, Dr. Durandis. Thank you, Dr. Pazala. Thank you from our friends from Maldives. And so what? Keep it coming so that I can just check if you are still engaged in the session. Dr. Subodha Manoj, do you have just um, send your message to our Q&A box. I hope that we will use our chat box from this time later. Dina Nunn. Okay, she's having problems with the uh, audio. Dina, it, it's not really working well. You can log out and then rejoin. Or maybe you could check yourself and click communicate in the upper left menu bar and then click speaker and microphone audio test. Thanks to Boda for your feedback. I think we're done and we're okay, so let's proceed. 
Thank you for your feedback. We really appreciate those feedback. You can also chat your response by typing your message to the speaker or to the panelists, the hosts, or both in the meeting room. But as I've said earlier, before we start formally, you cannot chat your response to all attendees in this meeting room. Because, this, because the panelists and the speakers are the only individual individuals in this meeting who can chat to everyone. As this, we request that if you want to chat to everyone, just chat to all panelists and we will just post it to everyone. We will post all your chats to everyone and we will address them to the best that we can. Lastly, you can post your questions by selecting the Q&A box icon. This is at the bottom right of your screen. You can assign the question using the drop-down menu, then you can key in your query. In this meeting, all questions should be addressed to the panelists, and, I will be, and we will be consolidating the questions and ask this to our speaker. If you have further clarifications, you can raise your hand using the raise hand, raise hand option and key in your clarification in the feedback bottom. For our program details, this session will run for 45 minutes to one hour. You can send your questions to our Q&A box as this arrives from your head. And lastly, please do not forget to check your email to because we will be sending our email feedback to everyone that will contain an evaluation for assessing the, the what has transpired in this session? If you do not, uh, if you do not receive the that form or that email from the secretariat, please do come and drop us a mail at secretariat at avian.org because that is our way for us to check and send you the resources, other artifacts, and other documents which we can share in this session. So those are the things we have to remember, our Cisco WebEx platform, the program details, how to participate, and our email feedback. You can also give us a Viber message at 639-27-803-8087 if you have wanted to reach out to us on another channel. Our speaker for tonight is Dr. Brown, who is the founder and chief executive officer of the Ontario Telemedicine Network one of the largest and most active integrated telemedicine networks in the world. An emergency physician who studied mathematics and engineering before embarking on his medical career, Dr. Brown is a passionate advocate for telemedicine as a tool to improve access to care, quality of care, and the sustainability of the healthcare system. I am now transferring the presentation controls to Dr. Brown, and I hope you can send your virtual applause to him. So good evening, Dr. Brown. Welcome to the AEN Hour, the special session for the Ontario Telemedicine Network. Hi, Dr. Brown. Hi there, how are you? Feeling great at a 9 p.m. here in Manila. Great, thanks for that introduction. I, I learned a lot uh, from your introduction, Aaliyah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering if you can see uh, if you can see my screen. Okay, I think who is not yet uh, registering on us, but you can click Quick Start tab, and then you can click Share Your Desktop, so that you okay. can see your slide presentation. All right, so I hope it will arrive soon. Next, okay, can you try it once more? Okay. okay. And you have to share my screen. There we go. Is it uploading or is it? Um, okay, I think it's going on our screen. It's arriving. From our end here in the Philippines, we have thank you Dina Nun, thank you Ray Ann for the check, thank you Satish Babu, thank you Cindy Wamlo for all the responses. All right, Dr. Brown, I think we're ready. So I hand now the floor to you to discuss tonight. Okay, so you can see it, Alia, in slideshow version. Yes, it is very clear. 
Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks again for uh, having me here today, and, and thanks, everybody. Uh, the way I'd like to start is uh, perhaps to tell you uh, where I am. So I hope you can see a slide that says about Ontario. Uh, Leah, just confirm you have a slide that says about Ontario. Okay, we are having a bit of a lag here, but we're now seeing about Ontario. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a bit about where we are right now. So this is uh, North America here on the slide, and uh, uh, that's Canada across the top of the slide here. That small country below us is the USA. Uh, and if you uh, drill into that gray area to see where we are, uh, that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, it's a pretty big place, Ontario, even though it's just one province. It's about a million uh, square kilometers. And uh, when I looked at uh, Wikipedia, Last night, I, I saw that that was about the size of Thailand plus Cambodia plus Malaysia uh, altogether, just to give you an idea of that size. Uh, but we have a lot less people. We only have about 13 and a half, uh, coming up to 14 million people across that giant geography. Um, and most of them actually live way down in the southern part. Uh, so about 12 million people live down in the south, and only a million live in the vast, vast area to the north. Uh, so you can kind of see from that geography how important telemedicine has been, particularly to serve uh, people who are very far away uh, from where most of the medical care is in southern Ontario. And in fact, uh, you'll see across the top there's a road. Uh, north of that, of that last northern road, there's actually no other roads in the summer. They have winter roads made of ice, uh, but most of the year uh, they use little airplanes to fly, uh, to fly people in and out. So, those little airplanes often carry food and supplies in, and they often carry sick people back out for care. Uh, so telemedicine certainly has uh, a history of being very useful uh, in those small communities. Uh, you can see by the numbers here that uh, we spend a lot on healthcare. So this population, uh, it's about $44 billion a year is our annual healthcare budget. Uh, that's in Canadian funds. Uh, if you're thinking about US funds, it's Roughly 44 billion U.S., so it's pretty. It's been pretty close. Little, little less now. Uh, and the responsibility for healthcare is in Canada is provincial. So our federal government does not get too involved. They have a Canada Health Act that uh, provides some principles. Uh, universal coverage being one of the most important principles. Uh, but the provincial government itself is accountable for the actual delivery of healthcare. Uh, they do provide some payments to the provinces. Uh, and the federal government uh, uh, funds health care specifically for Aboriginal peoples, so peoples living on, on reserves uh, in the far north. Um, most provinces do devolve some uh, level of control to uh, regional health authorities. And in Ontario, the province I'm in, there's 14 of them. They're called local health integration networks. Uh, what's interesting is that although we have really what we consider a publicly funded uh, health care system, uh, it really covers only about 70% of all the costs that are needed to fund healthcare. Uh, what we do have that I think is fairly unique is that 100% of all what we consider core essential services, including physician services and hospital services, are covered. So people never have to co-pay or pay for physicians for core services or for their uh, hospitalizations. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't cover a lot of dentistry. That's usually out of pocket or private insurance. Uh, we do cover drugs for either uh, low-income people or seniors, but not for the general population. And then there's you know, different levels of coverage uh, for allied health professionals and home and community services. Uh, one of the interesting things about our environment is that uh, although we have this publicly funded system, most of the physicians and the organizations are all independent. You know, hospitals all have their own CEO and board of directors. Uh, physicians actually run their own practices and they bill the government for uh, their fee for service for the most part, but they actually all run their own organizations. And that's a really, really interesting challenge for uh, folks like us who are trying to uh, create telemedicine across a vast region with thousands and thousands of independent doctors and organizations because we have to come up with a model 
that uh, brings all these people together, and yet we actually don't have any uh, governance or management control specifically over those healthcare providers. And so that's been a challenge that we've been dealing with for uh, many years, and I think that probably resonates in a lot of uh, countries in the world, you know, having a lot of independent providers, but needing to think of a way to turn them into a network of providers, a network of folks who can provide better service to the, uh, to the community. Uh, we have uh, uh, this new plan. This is hot off the press uh, from our uh, uh, health minister. It's called Patients First Action Plan for Healthcare. So this is how we're trying to transform our system. Uh, number one on the list is access. Uh, really connecting and coordinating care in the community is number two. Uh, making, pe making sure people are engaged in their own decisions about their healthcare. And of course, looking at how to make the system sustainable, because like every other jurisdiction on earth, uh, funding uh, is uh, a challenge, and we want to make sure the investments we make are better for patients and are better value uh, for our healthcare dollar. So the exciting thing about this for us as a telemedicine network is that you know telemedicine, virtual healthcare services are really uh, pretty much critical to, to many of, of these initiatives. Uh, and really, we feel like we're a key enabler to uh, our health system transformation. Okay, so just to check there, Aliyah, I hope you're still there with me. Yes, we're yes, we're still here. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that you can hear. Um, okay. So now I'm going to just uh, so that's our background. So that's what we're like here in Canada. That's what healthcare looks like. And now I'm going to tell you how the Ontario Telemedicine Network. Uh, has grown within that framework. Uh, I know from speaking uh, uh, to Alvin Marcello, this, this is a big issue across uh, many of your uh, countries. You know, how do you develop a governance model uh, to uh, ensure that telemedicine uh, is effective? Um, and this is really kind of what we've done. So OTN is actually not a part of government. Um, we made a conscious decision in collaboration with the government to create it as an independent, not-for-profit corporation. We do get most of our funding from the Government of Ontario, uh, but we also have other revenue sources. We have uh, some federal funding through project grants, uh, and we sell, sell various services. We sell some consulting services, for example. Uh, but basically, we're an independent, not-for-profit, and our mission is really to make healthcare better. Uh, we have an independent board of directors of uh, a dozen wise people. Um, and the key element for us has probably been the idea of this membership model. So uh, everybody who uses our service across the province is a member. Uh, often their membership is paid for, so Ministry of Health funded organizations don't have to pay the membership fee. Um, they're funded through our grant funding from uh, the Ministry of Health. But basically all of these folks uh, sign a collaboration agreement with us, and that collaboration agreement lays out the rules of the road. Uh, here's the privacy and security requirements. Here are the technical standards that are required for you to link into this network. Uh, here's the business processes that all of us share uh, so that everybody knows how to find everybody else and connect with everybody else. Um, and, be, and we have a, a very large uh, membership. So because it's so large, the cost per individual membership is, is very low. It's almost a nominal fee uh, for most of the uh, folks out there and, of course, for uh, provincially funded health providers, the, the fee is zero. Uh, so it, it just makes sense for them uh, to join this network and to be able to leverage all the resources on the network. Uh, another, uh, you know, and, and this sounds uh, fairly straightforward, but the critical piece of this is that it's allowed us to really create a harmonized governance model where everybody um, has the same set of standards and the same way of working with each other, and, and that's, that's not to be underestimated. Uh, if you compare that, for example, to the world of the electronic health record, uh, where there are many, many, many different health records, and uh, you know a lot of the money, time, and energy is spent simply on trying to make those electronic health records interoperable, as opposed to really trying to provide better services for the for the patients out there. So I think it's exciting to be in a place where we do have uh, pretty much a uniform standard uh, across the province. We do spend a lot of time working with key partners. Uh, we do have an e-health agency that is working on electronic health records. Uh, we have a group that is busy uh, helping physicians uh, develop electronic medical records in their office. 
Uh, about uh, 80, 85% of them now have electronic medical records. So we work with all of those groups to make sure that we're integrated and, the, and we're looking forward to a seamless future of interoperability, although that part of the puzzle is not solved here yet. Uh, in order to, uh, I mean, this is, this is the services that we're providing across the network at the moment. So uh, clinical video conferencing, uh, has been our, our biggest, busiest, and long-standing long service. We've been doing this for, uh, I think, 15 or 17 years now across the province. Uh, for us, it means two-way television, uh, medical devices like digital stethoscopes, handheld exam cameras. Uh, basically, people are able to see a specialist in an urban center uh, without having to travel. Uh, same technology used for uh, education events and administrative events. Uh, and of course, in the last number of years, uh, we've moved from simply having you know, expensive hardware-based systems to having uh, PC-based and mobile video conferencing that links into this network, uh, and also being able to uh, link directly to patients in their homes if they're uh, computer literate. Uh, we have uh, a second class of service, which is store forward applications. Uh, those have a, it has a lot of names for this service, but e-consult is the basic idea, provider to provider e-consult. Uh, biggest one for us is probably dermatology, uh, where you can take a picture of a rash, send some information, send that to a dermatologist, uh, and get an opinion back. And uh, the exciting part about that is the, the opinions come back quickly. So within a couple of days, uh, your patient is able to get a, a, an expert opinion. Um, and finally, uh, telehome care, the bold new frontier of moving right into the patient's homes. Uh, so we're focused, uh, we're focused on uh, 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 monitoring uh, patients with uh, significant uh, chronic diseases, patients who are heavy users of the hospital system, for example. We give them a uh, tablet. Uh, we have uh, wireless uh, devices, like pulse oximeters in their home. They answer questions. Uh, we have nurses who coach them. And this has really had a dramatic impact for us. Those patients uh, have reduced their admissions to hospital by roughly 50%. So a, a huge change in, in the quality of their health care. Um, in order to, to do all of that, uh, we've learned over the years that we have to support, uh, we have to support uh, the providers to, to actually do this. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to organize uh, uh, scheduling at both ends, to find each other. Uh, we need to train people, we need to help people uh, integrate this into their practice. So we've developed this set of services that you see on the slide uh, that OTN provides to just help people do that. Uh, and more and more, of course, these are uh, self-service, they're online. Uh, we have a self-scheduling portal, for example. Uh, but in the early days, this was a call center, which then evolved into, uh, into online services. Uh, if you want to get an idea of the numbers, so last year we did about 390,000 uh, clinical consultations across the network. Uh, there's been about 4,000 patients registered for telehome care. Uh, across the province, there's roughly 3,400 of the hardware-based or room-based telemedicine carts. Uh, there's about 7,000 personal video conferencing users right now. That's the software, mobile applications. Uh, there's 3,000 primary care physicians using teledermatology, uh, and we're just uh, expanding uh, other specialties for e-consult, and there's about 576 MDs using that today. Um, we also have something called the Hub, uh, which I'm going to tell you a bit uh, in a minute, but there's about 14,000 health providers who are users of the Hub. Uh, and this is our telehome care graph. This is in one particular hospital. This hospital actually saw a 70% reduction in hospital admissions. So, you know, this is a before and after slide. Um, and you can see the big fat hospital admissions on the right and the slender, slender lower emergency visits and hospital visits on the, on the right side. Uh, just to drill down a bit, uh, hope, I hope everybody's still able to hear me well. Uh, just uh, the next section, I'll just give you a little bit uh, of, a, of a view of our services, and then I'll touch on, thank you. Somebody just said yes, they can hear me. Thank you very much. Uh, this will uh, uh, give you an idea of what these services are. So we have a scheduling uh, portal, as I mentioned. Uh, it's really a transactional system where people can look at other people's uh, schedules without seeing what's in the schedule. 
um, and uh, easily organize their care over a distance. It's really wonderful for education. You simply uh, book it and uh, add all the friends that you want to invite, and they all get an email, and then they say yes or no, um, and they can join. Um, I think because of this, education has become very active. Last year, we had uh, over 21,000 education events. Um, and those events would include an event like today's. This would count as one event, um, or an event with multi-point video across the province. Last week, we had, uh, actually earlier this week, we had an event to uh, teach people about uh, Ebola. Um, and I think we had 64 uh, communities online for that one. So it's easy to create a very large event, and we had 21,000 of those education events last year. Uh, we also, over the years, uh, have built up a uh, online training uh, resource. Last year, we actually trained about 6,000 people. Uh, to, you know, there's different courses for different types of providers. Uh, there's e-learning, and of course, we do some live uh, training as well. Uh, and we do run a call center. The call center still supports uh, scheduling, especially very difficult or complex scheduling events. Um, and, and we do technical support. Uh, this gives you an idea of the type of volume uh, that we get in a month uh, across the network, including uh, uh, technical support, scheduling, uh, service activations, which are people requesting new services or new customers, and then just managing accounts. Uh, we're very conscious of trying to provide a, a, a customer-focused service, and our satisfaction rates generally are in the range you see there, in the uh, uh, sort of low 90% satisfaction area. Uh, oh, there's more satisfaction. So that gives you uh, uh, our first quarter of 2014-15. This is the kind of dashboard that, uh, that we watch. Okay, just... Uh, I'm going to switch gears a bit here and just tell you about our hub. So this is the way that uh, we are now rolling out online services across Ontario. Uh, it's otnhub.ca uh, if you wanted to go to the website. Uh, what we're trying to do is put all the services that you need in one place, uh, but also uh, give you access to all of the clinical and educational resources that are being offered around the province. And that's through our telemedicine directory which is integrated into the hub. Uh, we look at this as really a distribution channel. So it's a place not only to do your telemedicine services, but also it's a matchmaker, it's a broker, it's a place where people can meet, uh, if you will, uh, an eBay uh, for, uh, for healthcare. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. So uh, this is the directory. It looks a little like Google, uh, where you search for Whatever you need, you can search for a psychiatrist, you can search for a site near where your patient lives, uh, you can search for a program, um, and across the top are all the services that you have personally signed up for. So this particular Dr. Thompson uh, has access to the directory, has access to video conferencing, personal video conferencing, can send you consult, can do scheduling, and can look at our learning calendar to see uh, what courses uh, he or she may want to take. Um, and if you search for, you know, this is a cardiologist, you could search, you get a list of cardiologists, you click on it, and you'll get their profile. Um, in this case, uh, uh, you can see a cardiologist right here. Uh, it also says what services they offer. If I could scroll down here, you, this, this provider can self-maintain their profile. Uh, they can tell you how to refer to them. Um, and at the top right, you can actually do stuff right from this directory. So if you clicked on the little camera icon, on the top right, you can actually call this doctor. Of course, we urge you to uh, make sure that they expect your call before you do that, but you could also just add him to your buddies list uh, and call him later. Uh, when you're actually doing video conferencing, this is your uh, home page. Uh, so you'll have your schedule for the day. Uh, your buddies are down the right. Uh, you can see that there's a connect button. So when you're ready to see, I think at 9, 9 a.m., which is coming up for me, uh, if I wanted to see John A. Smith, uh, I would click on the connect button there and poof, uh, I would see John wherever he happens to be in the province. So as you can see, we've tried to make this uh, as simple as we can uh, for health professionals to use. Uh, the next slide is uh, 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 fairly new for us, but we've started to uh, enable providers to see patients at home so the patient no longer has to go to a hospital or a studio. It's called send an invite. So what you do is you fill in the patient's uh, name and email address. Uh, you set the time for the appointment. The patient gets an email. 
uh, they click on the link and they're able to enter into the video room and see you. Uh, so you can do it immediately or you can schedule it. If you schedule it, it just shows up you know, in, in your schedule on the previous slide. Okay. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I wanted to consider just for this talk was uh, any kind of wisdom I could provide in terms of what we thought our key success factors were. Uh, so here's a short list. Uh, I think clearly uh, governance is essential to this. So you can't have this kind of a network effect. And I think it's very important to, to realize that this is a network effect of attracting you know, many providers to do this uh, without developing a governance model. Uh, in our case, that's taken the form of a membership model as well as an integral part of that. Um, and then policy. So you know, some of the key things are you know, will it, is a doctor paid to do this kind of service? Uh, there are many physicians who are very altruistic uh, and will we'll do it regardless. Uh, but of course, uh, in the long term, you need to make this part of your health system. There need to be appropriate incentives. And uh, our government came along with us and said, you know, we will uh, fund physician fees for consultations. Uh, but there's been a lot of work since then. You know, should we pay for a visit to a patient's home? Uh, still a question for us, and how much is that worth? Uh, we're still working through models of how to pay for e-consult. Right now we're testing a number of different payment models there. Uh, our first official uh, insured fees were for teledermatology and teleophthalmology, and we're still building other fees. So there is lots of policy work on, on, that, on that front as well. Uh, it's also critical to find the value. So uh, you know, over the years, we've identified lots of points of value for us. Um, you know, last year uh, we avoided 260 million kilometers of travel by using telemedicine. Uh, and that includes travel in the north, which is actually subsidized by the government. Uh, so if all the people in northern Ontario who use telemedicine had actually traveled last year, it would have cost our government about $62 million. Uh, our base funding is $22.5 million. So we think we're a profit center for the taxpayer of Ontario, and that's a good thing, uh, just in that one area. Uh, so I think you know, policy, the governance, the membership model, uh, clearly uh, providers need a little help. Uh, so the supporting services are important. They just aren't going to be able to do the scheduling and all the other bits and pieces and the technology support without someone helping them, and so we took that on. Uh, and of course, we have a laser focus on value on getting people to use the technology. We work with providers around the province. We have a team of people that does that uh, to help them get started um, and make sure that it uh, has the, the value for them and for their uh, patients. Okay, so those are some of the key success factors. Uh, there, there is a new emerging world. Uh, I'm sure with this audience that I have on the phone now, you probably all have a smartphone in your pocket. I don't know if you have an Android or a um, a Canadian Blackberry or, a, or an iPhone, uh, but uh, certainly uh, uh, it's a new emerging world in terms of the consumer readiness and the connectedness of the consumer. And so we're uh, fairly aggressively looking at how to leverage that opportunity. Um, and we think that there's a lot of change afoot. When we look at uh, general practitioner visits, primary care visits in the U.S. and Canada, there are about 600 million of those annually. Uh, and we think about half of them, the patient doesn't really have to go to the office. They could easily do that visit uh, electronically through uh, uh, electronic messaging or video. Uh, and that, that would be an amazing shift in terms of how healthcare is actually delivered. So we're looking at new models to encourage health and wellness, to engage patients in their own healthcare, deliver care to patients directly, and uh, just enabling uh, providers to collaborate better with each other. Uh, we're spending a little time working with some of the leaders in the healthcare system, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what the different types of applications should be for different uh, uh, groups of patients. So consumers uh, need one thing; they need they want uh, easy access to healthcare when they get sick, uh, but not a lot more. Once you start to get a chronic disease. There's opportunities to provide you with apps and other supports to help uh, guide you with your chronic disease. When you get sicker, you need a team of people. So how do we organize teams of healthcare providers to be effective and efficient 
Uh, and there's certainly lots of technologies to help with sicker people, with a complex or frail elderly, uh, or even you know if you've had surgery or have an acute illness that's just lasting a while, um, then you're able to uh, to use technology to have your team support you. Uh, so just a few examples. I'm sure you see lots of toys. The, the interesting thing for us is not necessarily the, the, the technology now because there's lots of amazing stuff out there. The interesting thing is how do we really use this and integrate it uh, to create value in our healthcare system? Uh, and you've probably seen things like this. This is something called Proteus. It's a pill that you swallow. Uh, when, uh, when it gets wet, uh, it uh, sends out a wireless message and lets you know that you've swallowed it. Um, I like that because now patients can't lie to their doctor anymore and say they took their pills. Uh, the other, this is a, basically an ICU and a Band-Aid, seven vital signs that are uh, transmitted. Uh, here's a continuous blood sugar monitor. Uh, when you eat that piece of chocolate cake, that thing, uh, you know, will vibrate and let you know something's up. But certainly there's many, many tools like this that enable you to communicate with your health providers, but also to self-manage your own care uh, to look after yourself in a better way. Uh, we think that uh, an important part of our next generation, and this is not this is not implemented. This is kind of uh, theoretical here, but we we think that there needs to be really a shared care plan. We're calling it one patient, one team, one care plan, uh, and everybody sharing the same plan uh, and, and being able to communicate and find each other is appropriate. And eventually, we're going to get to this point uh, where we have uh, you know standardized care pathways. Uh, there's a plan that's designed around the patient. Uh, there's standard approaches to responding to that plan. Uh, there's possibly remote monitoring or self-management uh, in the middle to support patients. Uh, there's a care team for those who need it the most. And then when we get to the world of analytics, uh, some real-time uh, decision support. So that's a little peek at the future and, and really what we're thinking about right now. Uh, I was told that you're very interested in uh, architectures. Uh, I am not an architect, uh, but uh, I will uh, give you kind of an idea of uh, how we are uh, building architecture here. Uh, this has gotten a lot simpler since I got into this business. Uh, we've tried to make this uh, um, as easy as possible and as rational as possible. What I'm showing you here is not OTN's architecture. I will get to that in a minute. But this is really our provincial uh, architecture. Uh, and it's pretty simple. There's, there's a business view and a systems view and an information view. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of places get bogged down worrying about all the systems. And I think the important thing is to actually make sure you know what your business is before you, before you do anything. Uh, and that's what this slide refers to. So what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? Who's going to do it? Um, and at the end of the day, how does that impact the, uh, the patient? Um, at the end of the line here. So really thinking about the goals and uh, the pathway, I think, is, is a critical step here. Um, the information view, again, what do you do with the information? And this gives you a uh, line of sight uh, to how the information will uh, flow through uh, your system, whatever that system happens to be. And then a lot of people spend most of their time here. This is where it gets complicated and expensive, trying to build those systems. Um, and in fact, in Ontario, you know, we have the plans, but it, we're, we're, we're not done. We're still doing this. Um, the particularly exciting for us is we've been launching the first uh, pile, the uh, health information access layer, which is really the controller uh, with, with security and uh, uh, pointers and uh, registries of all the patients and providers uh, that links the core infrastructure out to uh, the end users at the other end. So OTN has been really building um, uh, our, our stuff and a lot of the provincial stuff has been happening in parallel and more and more we're now starting to be able to, uh, to integrate with the, uh, with the broader system. Um, and that's a big piece of work for us is making sure that it is completely integrated. Uh, the view that we have um, has really, we've got two perspectives of it here. Uh, so this, this is a, a stylized kind of view of uh, uh, what we call our enabling products, and really this looks at how can we get people started? How do we get people enrolled? Uh, what are the services that they need to be enrolled in? Uh, so you can see they sign up, we actually validate them. Uh, the first major integration we, we, we've had with our provincial system is identity and access management. So we have a single identity and access management service for the province. Um, so if somebody wants to join, 
Uh, we actually, somebody actually goes to their office and uh, looks them in the eye, looks at their driver's license, and then signs them up and, and we know they're validated. Uh, so we're slowly moving our existing uh, base of users over to that system to make sure that everybody's validated. Uh, and then we have to manage the account and eventually we, we, we sometimes have to cancel the account. So that gives you an idea of that process. There's a bunch of uh, products and services that uh, are, are uh, brought to bear as needed on that. And then way at the bottom are all the supporting applications that we have to support those. Uh, the ones that are um, have the dashed boxes in the bottom right, those are the ones where we integrate with the uh, provincial health systems. So I already mentioned identity and access. Uh, HRM is, is the report manager. We're working on that right now. So uh, reports will come out of our system directly into the main provincial system. Um, through, when the HIL has integrated with electronic medical records, we will leverage that as well. So a lot of exciting work happening right now. Uh, and this is the other view. So this is what people actually do. Uh, and we have a very simple model here. You, you, uh, you basically do four things. You collaborate with other people, stay organized, you actually do your work, uh, and you learn and grow. And what you see under each of those are the different um, applications that, that support that, different workflows that support that. Um, and underlying all of that is uh, your personalized experience. So your profile, managing your own profile, self-serving your account, uh, the delegates that you choose. So if you're a physician, you know, you give your administrative assistant delegation rights to do all this for you and you probably never look at the computer for the most part, but certainly your administrative assistant is, uh, is trained and uh, um, knows how to organize the schedule and everything else, um, and then whatever your preferences are. So this is really the model that we've been working towards. Um, uh, in the next year, uh, we've got some specific plans. So, uh, of course, we want to keep growing. We've been growing at about 30% a year. Uh, our year ends March 31, so we have grown at about 30% over last year. Uh, we are expanding the home video visits. We want about 2,500 health providers to uh, start to use that to be able to link with their patients. Um, our telehome care program is now in most of the province, but we want to expand it to the whole province this year. Uh, and we also want to uh, add additional diseases. So right now uh, we have congestive heart failure, we have chronic lung disease patients, uh, we've started diabetes, uh, we want to add post-discharge acute patients and uh, palliative care in the home uh, as additional diseases and probably uh, chronic renal disease as well. Uh, we're going to keep enhancing our hub. That's a never-ending project. We keep uh, changing, adding, improving, and integrating uh, our uh, OT and hub. Uh, and uh, back to our new models of care, we're really looking at those new technologies and looking at uh, how those can uh, be integrated into our healthcare system. And the way we're doing that is we're working with leaders in the health system uh, who are, uh, you know, attacking specific problems and uh, we're going to look at what they're doing, what they're planning, be part of their planning teams and just help them uh, adapt uh, virtual care applications uh, into whatever their business model uh, ends up being. Uh, we think that uh, health providers will be prescribing apps uh, for chronic disease. We're particularly interested in diabetes, mental health and post-operative uh, type apps. Uh, we are uh, launching uh, pilots in that. We have something called a living lab where we're testing things. Um, and uh, on a broader scale, we're looking to see uh, whether we can bring together a, a wide uh, group of organizations across the province to really come up with a quality model. As you know, there's a lot of apps out there which are uh, not uh, really health system friendly, which are uh, you know, downright dangerous, uh, some of them. Uh, and we'd like to make sure that uh, we offer a list of apps that are appropriate and uh, maintain that quality structure. Uh, and we're going to use that hub as a way to tell people about this stuff and make it available to them through a directory, through a distribution channel uh, that really highlights the, the good apps that link uh, providers to their patients. Uh, we're also continuing to grow education. Uh, we've started to be uh, to offer our uh, e-learning uh, program development and hosting to other health organizations. So, uh, so far we've been using that predominantly for 
uh, OTN's training purposes, but we're also starting to host e-learning for other organizations that want to do that. Um, and uh, we've taken a large role in our senior strategy. Uh, we have an interprofessional group that's developing a, uh, a website aimed at the whole province to educate uh, all health providers on the best way to look after uh, seniors in, in all their different fields. Uh, so this is my last slide, and uh, this is a, a well-known science fiction writer. Uh, I don't know if uh, he's a bestseller in Asia or not, uh, but uh, the quote is, the future has already arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we, at this day and age, uh, we now have all the technology we need uh, to do almost anything in telemedicine. So the issue for us is, how do we get it out there? How do we uh, get people to adopt it at scale? How do we make it as useful as possible? How do we make sure the population gets the greatest benefit uh, from this you know, wonderful opportunity that we have right now? Um, and that's the work that we're trying to do here. Great presentation, Dr. Brown. We are really impressed of what OTN is doing. We have more time for our Q&A. I hope it's okay. Um, we have our first question from the Director of Telemedicine News and the Ministry of Health in Malaysia. She's delivering her question via voice. Hello, Dr. Fazula. Are you on your mic now? Can yes. you ask your question directly to Dr. Brown? Yes. Hello, Dr. Brown. Can you hear Hello. me? I can hear you. Uh, yes, oh, it's such an uh, excellent uh, presentation and, uh, uh, and congratulations. You have a great system there. Thank you. And, uh, my question is uh, about the financing mechanism. I understand you have a single payer system, but how does the provider get paid for this uh, teleconferencing e-consultation? That's yeah. my first question. Sure. So uh, the, uh, it depends on who the provider is. So the biggest challenge is uh, physicians because most of them are uh, fee for service, particularly our specialists. So uh, our our province uh, set up a system where uh, they actually, if they sign up with OTN and uh, sign a consent form and an agreement with OTN, then they can actually bill for their telemedicine services. Uh, the money doesn't come from our regular pot of uh, health care funding. It comes from uh, some other government area, but it does come from government, um, and they get paid uh, just as if they were doing it uh, through, the regular, through the regular system. Um, other health professionals, or if they're employed with a, with a facility, uh, then they would just uh, go ahead and do it if their uh, facility thought it was within their mandate um, and it would just be part of their regular work. Uh, if you're somebody who has to bill patients, then you would probably go ahead and just bill the patients as well. Uh, for example, uh, you know, psychologists are often not covered in our health system and they may uh, organize to meet the patient and just bill them just like they would in their office. Well, what about the chronic disease patients, their medical device and their uh, network and all, is it paid through the system or they have to pay their own? Yeah, actually it's free to those patients and mm -hmm. the reason it's free is uh, we've chosen the sickest patients in our healthcare system uh, to, uh, to receive this and they're very expensive patients. They end up landing in the hospital uh, uh, quite often uh, and so it's actually very cost effective for us to provide the technology and the service for those patients because we're reducing mm -hmm. their hospitalization so significantly. Right, right. Oh, okay, great. And uh, does OTN do an international consulting? <laughs> I mean, you have a great system there. Yes, we do. I'm sitting beside Karen Waite here, who's actually our senior consultant. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we do, we've, we've worked with uh, several governments around the world uh, to, help, uh, to help them develop uh, telemedicine strategies for their populations. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Brown, Mr. Dr. Brown. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fazula, for your question and for the follow-up. Really great to hear that. Um, let's address the questions which filed in our Q&A uh, Q box. All right, from Satish Babu. 
Is the OTN connected with Canada's Health Information Exchange? Uh, oh, Canada Health Info Way? Um, so it's Karen Waite uh, speaking. I think um, if you take a look at the architecture slide uh, and you see the the dotted lines around some of the repositories um, and the services that we're integrated with, um, that has all um, had the foundation in Canada Health InfoWay's um, blueprint that is being implemented across Canada. So there are bits and pieces of it that we're integrated with right now. Uh, we're not completely integrated at this point. Um, however, I think that's something that is uh, to come in the future. Does that help? Yes, very useful because um, uh, I know that everything is uh, still being developed as the thing is there's a framework which is where in other telemedicine implementations follow. All right, thanks, Karen. Other questions from the floor? Um, again, from Satish Babu. Dr. Brad, is the video conferencing software open source or is it available for developers or nonprofit organizations outside Canada? Uh, the actual software that we use is called Vidyo. Uh, that's V I D Y O. It's uh, a company that uh, has excellent uh, software. Our hub uh, leverages that for our personal video conferencing. We use their uh, application program interfaces, their APIs that drive that software, but that's the software in the background. Uh, sadly, they don't give it away for free. We have to pay them uh, licensing fees for that. Uh, but we, we did do uh, a, very, uh, a very detailed request for proposals several years back, uh, evaluated a lot of vendors, and uh, that one uh, proved to be the most, uh, really the best quality, most cost-effective one for us. Um, but uh, there are, I know there are other companies and other vendors out there, but that's the one that's uh, been doing a great job for us. All right, thanks. On that note, so it's um, a proprietary software uh, still under uh, being de also developed for uh, exclusive use by OTS. Another question from Atika from the Ministry of Health in Maldives. Atika, I am now unmuting you. I hope you can deliver your question via voice. Hello, Atika, are you on your microphone? Hello, one, two, three, Atika. Dr. Atika, I think uh, there's a problem. Hello? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. Hello? Yes. Hello? Can you hear me? I can. Hi there. Hello? 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 I can hear you. Okay. Um, hello, Dr. Brown. Hello. Hi. Um, it was really informative uh, <laughs> presentation. Um, yes, and I would really <laughs> um, say that uh, you have really progressed. But the thing is, we have. Uh, hello, can you hear us? Yes. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. I can hear you. Can hear Hello. You. Go ahead, Director Attica. Director Attica, go ahead. Hello. Yes, you, we can hear you very well. Go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, well, I'll go to straight to my question. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the question here is that uh, um, as a country, we are start, starting, starting to use uh, um, telemedicine recently. Uh, we have challenges like sustaining the system being used by mostly uh, because of the turnover of medical doctors here. Of course, the way you have, uh, you know, organized the management and uh, um, the governance is really much established over there, but here it is not. 
And how do we go about doing such a thing and make it sustainable? It's a question we have like um, the system is not in a way that we have to make people think the system. I mean, the doctors even who are being recruited from abroad, like what I'm saying is 80% are being recruited from abroad. So these turnovers are affecting the use of these systems. So um, could you give me some hints as to um, we, how we can go about uh, a problem like this in using the teleconferencing system? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, I, I think I missed part of your question. There was some interference, but I think if I understand correctly, you were asking I think uh, we how do we, Hello? with a large turnover of doctors, how do we uh, make it simpler for them to use the system? Hello? Is that, uh, Hello? Yep, hi there. Aliyah, could you, did you hear the question? Hello, Dr. Brad. Sorry for the internet. I think it's on the other end. The question is how um, do, how would you give, um, as, as I've heard it, okay. Malthus is setting up their telemedicine system. But the problem is their doctors are having a high turnover rate. They go, they go abroad and their environments do not support doctors working on the telemedicine system. So what would be your advice to them when you start to deploy this system in your country? I think the number one thing that we sometimes forget about is uh, basically having to make these things as simple as possible. You know, if you, if you buy a, a, an Android phone or an iPhone, you don't have to read a lot of manuals to be able to use it. You just touch the button and uh, it kind of works. And I think that's what we want telemedicine to be like so that people don't have to learn, especially physicians. They don't have a lot of patients in my experience. I'm one of them, so I know. Uh, and uh, they really uh, just want to either pick it up and use it or have their assistants support them with it. They're very busy. So anything you can do to make it simple and easy and support them will go a long way to really uh, making, it, uh, making it stick. All right, thank you very much. So the key term is make everything simple so that it would be user friendly and would be earlier, uh, it will be later on adopted. All right, we have uh, more questions from the floor. Um, let me just check our question. We go, uh, thanks Dr. Uh, Director Asika from Maldives for your question. Very helpful for countries who are starting their telemedicine. Okay, who decides from Satish Babu? Who decides on in OTM if the patient needs hospitalization? Do you do any assessment? No. So OTN itself does not deliver any healthcare at all. Uh, so we're not a healthcare organization. We support healthcare providers. Uh, they use our tools, they use, uh, you know, we train them on, uh, we, do, we do support training, for example, we, we train uh, nurses on, on some complex disease management. We do that in collaboration with other clinical organizations, but we do not actually deliver any care ourselves. So it's really up to the providers. They make the best decisions that they make, uh, just like they would uh, if the patient was there in person. They, they have to use their best clinical judgment. Uh, when they use technology over a distance. All right. So I think that would be a thing to consider also for those who are start starting up because um, OTN is a separate entity uh, from the government. And um, really having a dedicated um, network for telemedicine implementation it will really help the government to put up this system. Here's the last question, I think, from the Philippines. Uh, so we have two more questions before we end from, doc, uh, from Ramon Durandes. Is there le legislation specifically about telemedicine and in Canada? Uh, actually, we have not other than uh, adding some uh, billing codes. There, <laughs> there's legislation that uh, there probably should be. Uh, there's a lot of very old legislation here uh, that hasn't been changed, that, that uh, was put in place before kind of these ideas existed. So 
they can be interpreted in many different ways. Uh, we choose to interpret them, you know, to support telemedicine, uh, but they probably need to be updated. The, the one, the, the legislation probably that's most relevant to us is around uh, privacy. So there is a Personal Health Information Protection and Promotion Act, um, and so we are very, very careful about privacy and security. <clears throat> we have a whole team that looks after it, um, and uh, <clears throat> really we can't do any of this um, unless we're very comfortable that patient information is private and secure. And so that, that's probably the most important piece of legislation. Okay. Um, next question is, when discussing telemedicine, such as online video consultation, many doctors raise the need to do physical examination of patients. What has been the experience of OTN with respect to this area of concern? Sure. Uh, you know, that, of course, if the patient really needs a physical examination, then you, you shouldn't really be doing virtual health care. You shouldn't do telemedicine. Uh, if, if part of the examination requires that, then, you know, just don't do it. Uh, you know, sometimes with a nurse at the remote end, <clears throat> you, the, the physician can, uh, um, you know, develop a trust enough to trust that examination. But for the most part, you just don't do telemedicine. However, I think as people gain experience in the field, they uh, get more and more comfortable with certain elements of telemedicine. Uh, so often we will have doctors who say, you know, I won't do a first uh, consultation, I'll only do a follow-up uh, using telemedicine. And then after they've been doing it for a year, uh, they realize that there are a certain set of initial consultations they could do uh, as well. So they begin to expand their scope uh, until they find the right place and the right balance. But I don't think anybody would say that telemedicine is replacing the healthcare system. It's just another tool uh, that you have uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, practice, uh, to practice medicine, to deliver health care, and you have to use that tool in the right way. All right. Thank you. Um, at the end of the day, evaluate, evaluation and your own judgment would really matter in doing a telemedicine consultation. Last question from Bangladesh. We have telemedicine service in Bangladesh, but it cannot be expanded to primary care for because of infrastructure and cost, what is your uh, thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I guess uh, sometimes uh, challenges like that, you know, can lead to the best creativity. Uh, and I think uh, there's probably some good examples in many parts of the world of, of using cell phones, uh, you know, uh, starting with texting uh, as, as needed. Uh, you know, a lot of people have smartphones and may have uh, enough cell service to run that, or even just a, a traditional cell phone can be a very powerful telemedicine tool. Um, so I think really looking at what the health requirements are um, and seeing, you know, what kind of practical tools are available to, uh, to support healthcare, and I think you'll be surprised at, at how powerful a cell phone can be with, you know, with texting. Yeah, really, now that now the technology is being developed for more and more uses. Um, there's, okay, we have more questions in the floor, but I think we will be um, really the, um, addressing this after this session because we have already exceeded the hour of our, uh, of our session. But we have pending questions from um, Cindy Wangmo and from um, the Maldives from the Ministry of Health and Maldives. We will be sending this to Dr. Brown, and I hope that you will be um, happy to address this and be sent to everyone uh, so that they will be still part of the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for your question, uh, for your discussion for this evening, and thank you all to your queries. Any last message, Dr. Brown, and encouraging our countries here in Asia as we develop and or improve our telemedicine system? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. It was a, a real pleasure, and uh, I'm excited that all of, all of you are uh, really looking so intently at uh, telemedicine. I think uh, it's, it's got a great future, and it's wonderful that you're, uh, that you're engaged in uh, thinking about how this can improve healthcare. I'd love to uh, answer your questions. My email is ebrown, E-B-R-O-W-N, at otn.ca. 
Uh, if I can be of help, please uh, please let me know, and uh, I wish you all the best. All right. Um, Dr. Brown, is it okay if we um, share your presentation slide to the those who have attended the session? Uh, yes. All right. So um, that answers the, the questions I've been receiving by a personal chat. We will be sharing Dr. Ed Brown's slide to those who attended the session. Thank you so much for being with us in this special alien hour here at 9 p.m. in Manila. And we hope that we can see you at a regular AN hour on March 12, 9. Uh, this is going to be at the same time. I uh, know uh, this is going to be a special AN hour, even though it's going to be on a Thursday still. It's on March 12, 9 a.m. Manila time. Our topic is on leveraging public health data from a network of outpatient EHRs. We are now featuring the New York City experience of the Primary Care Information Project. Again, this is Aliyah Evangelista. Good evening, everyone, and we hope that we will see more of you in our next session. Thank you to, to, the, to our friends in the Ministry of Health in Bangladesh, in Maldives, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, Sri Lanka. Um, I hope I have everyone on board, and um, India. And Bangladesh. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, and good night. And good Thank morning you. to you there. Bye bye.